Hi, uh, Ramesh Vastu here, editor in chief, Side Seekers. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Please do subscribe this for the HR news, for HR updates, and conversation with the top of CHROs and thought leaders. Agenda of the day is uh, Talent Strategy 2023. And today we have the world renowned thought leader, uh, Mr. Mark Ifran, president of the Talent Strategy Group and author of a best selling book, Eight Steps to High Performance. Mark is joining us from USA. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Ramesh. Great to be speaking with you today. Mark, if I'm not wrong, you have been here in India in 2018. So how was the I, I... Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I'm saying, how was the visit in 2018? Well, I've been together? coming to India since 2000, actually. Um, the, okay. the short version is uh, I was with a, a firm at the time called Hewitt, then Aon Hewitt Consulting. And we were running a survey called the Top Companies for Leaders. And we were doing that around the world. So we had an Asia Pacific version of that. And I was invited out by the local team to, uh, to be at the awards ceremony for that. That was my first session out there. And they introduced me to a lot of firms, to the Birla Group, to uh, others. And so I started doing work out there. And so I've been working on and off there for almost 20 years. I've been fortunate to work with Reliance, with the Burlas, with Industry and Coca-Cola, with Infi, with Cognizant, uh, and many other uh, large mm -hmm. Indian companies. So I haven't been back since the pandemic, but I'm trying to plan a trip for this year. So I look forward to being there soon. Great. But if you look at the current uh, historic scenario, so uh, the work culture is utterly disrupted. And uh, employee engagement is lowest uh, than ever. So in such a time, uh, finding uh, top talent and retaining the talent is a top challenge for the HR leaders in this year. So uh, in such a scenario, what is uh, the best talent strategy uh, for the HR leaders in 2023? I would suggest a few things. First, keep the talent you have. Let's start there. Let's keep the best talent that you have. Let's call it the, the top 90%. So for the top 90% of people, and I'll talk about the strategy, let's focus on making sure they stay there because as we all know, it's easier to keep people than it is to replace people. So I think the starting point is understanding what do most employees want in any company to stay and be engaged. And the good news is there's lots of science around this. It's very clear they want a company they can be proud of, which means a, a good brand, good leaders, they want an opportunity to develop and grow. That doesn't always mean up, but they can learn, they can grow, they can develop, and they want a manager who cares about them. Those three things are just human needs, and so they're going to apply at any company. And yet the challenge is that too many companies, they try to get very fancy around engagement and ignore the basics. And unless you have that strong foundation of a company that you're proud of, development opportunities, and a manager who cares about you, all the other fanciness around you know, cool workplaces and online learning, it doesn't matter. So I would start by saying, focus on the top 90% of people you already have. Make sure that they're being managed properly. Much more likely they'll stay. Bottom 10%, personally, I don't care if they go uh, because if they're in the bottom 10%, it suggests you could do better with other people. But then if you need to attract people, I would go back to uh, a few questions. First is, do you really understand the compelling value proposition at your company or are you buying on price? So that's the basic equation is if I'm simply looking for software engineers and I'm willing to pay them X rupees a month, well, then I'm simply buying on price. And if I want more of them, I need to because of the market. Raise the, raise the price. So if I'm purely buying on price, then buy on price. Spend more money to get more people. That's a very easy equation. But if I'm buying on quality, then let's make sure I'm truly understanding the type of people that I'm trying to attract. Let's make sure that I'm very clear about the, the, the culture, the, the attitude, the mindset that I'm trying to bring into my company, and then create the value proposition around that. I find too often companies lead with a value proposition. Here's who we want to be. And I always ask the question, why do you want to be that? Is that because you as the creator of the value proposition like that? Or are you creating the most attractive environment for other people to join the company? So that's my, my long answer to your short question. Uh, let's start with keep 
most of the people that you have by managing the basics well, but then be very clear about what is your differentiating value proposition? Why would anyone come to work for you? But be very clear about what's unique about our company. If I'm in Infi, what's unique about Infi? I'm in Cognizant, what's unique about Cognizant? Why are we a little bit different than that other employer that you might be speaking with? Right, I think absolutely right. If we see there are various reports which are also indicating that uh, uh, the focus of the HR leader that to be on quite high, but the focus that to be on the talent management part, how they can they can uh, more focus on the talent they already have, uh, their talent development, their learning part, these are the that that, that, that may be the focus for uh, HR leaders in 2023. So, what is your opinion? How how they can go and retain the talent? They can because retention is also a challenge. We are talking about the. Uh, quiet quitting, the, we are talking about the career pushing, we are talking about the moonlighting. So that indicate that uh, they are not engaged, they are uh, on the way to uh, leave the organization. So how they can retain the talent, that is also a challenge. So what is your opinion on this? Sure. Uh, I would start with the 2575 rule, the 2575 rule. I really, really care about retaining the top 25%, my highest performers, my highest potential leaders. So let's start with that group. For that group, I want to make sure first we tell them. We're very transparent. Ramesh, you're one of our highest potential leaders. We think you have the opportunity to move far and fast in our organization. We're thinking about A and B and C for you. Um, and it comes with certain responsibilities, X, Y, Z. So tell that high potential leader so they know we think you're fantastic. We're going to invest in you. Here are our thoughts about your future. Same thing for high performers. Even if you're a high performer but not a high potential, let's say you are – you're, you're in a technical role. You're the head of international tax. Well, head of international tax is probably not going to be promoted to CFO, but they're probably very, very good at what they do. So let's make sure that they understand we love your performance. We want to keep developing you. Uh, we're going to make sure that you've got a great manager. You get good exposure in the company. If you want to learn a few other things, we're, we're happy to help you out with that. So for that top 25%, my highest performers and my highest potentials, I want to lock them in. Because the science is clear, they are delivering anywhere between 50% and 1,000% better results than average performers. So while I probably want to keep a lot of people who I really, really want to make sure doesn't walk out that door is my absolute best talent. For the rest of that population, I would say my answer is very similar to what we talked about in the first question. Let's execute flawlessly on the fundamentals of, of good talent management, the fundamentals of good engagement around great managers and great company and, and great development opportunities. That's very likely to keep most other people around. And for all of those people, and, and I wrote about this in Eight Steps to High Performance, we all have the opportunity to contribute more. We could all be higher performers. So I want to shift the curve, uh, the, the mean performance score for everyone. So you know, if the curve is at five on a one out of 10 scale, I want to shift the average up to six uh, in terms of how well people perform. And, and that goes just to the fundamentals of great goal setting and great coaching and great networking and, and all the other things that we know work well. Yeah, yeah, you you have uh, 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 I think uh, quoted the eight steps to high performers. So uh, that time I think it was released in 2018, and that time it was the mostly it was the physical work, uh, means uh, from the office, work from the office. Now the scenario is a little changed. Uh, people are working in a hybrid work model. People are working in a flexible uh, work model. So so uh, do you still uh, uh, would you like to continue with the same eight steps? Uh, what you suggested as a high uh, performance, uh, there would be any modification. What, what is your opinion on this? Short answer, yes. Let me give you a long answer as well. So the short answer is yes. The long answer is despite the pandemic, despite all the changes that we've all experienced over the past three years, companies' needs and CEOs' desires really haven't changed. What did companies want before the, the pandemic? They wanted smart hardworking, well-behaved, engaged, high-performing leaders. What do they want after the pandemic? The exact same thing. 
So companies' needs haven't changed. Companies still want the exact same thing they wanted. And so let's call that the demand side of the equation. We'll shift into an economic conversation. The demand side of the equation is I still want the same thing. If Ramesh is a smart, hardworking, well-behaved, highly engaged leader, great. I still want him there. The challenge is the supply side of the equation. Does Ramesh want to be that individual? And I think we can all recognize the market has shifted a bit. It hasn't completely changed, but it's shifted a bit where people are now saying, look, I'm going to give you a solid eight hours a day, but I'm not going to give you any more. Okay, so what that suggests to me is a few things. First, going back to our my answer from the last question, let's make sure I know who my best talent is. Let's still have a focus on them. But then what's that value proposition for that, that middle segment? They're still going to, to show up. They might not want to deliver as much as possible. But when I think about the eight steps, they still absolutely apply because they are the fundamentals, the psychological fundamentals of how people perform at work. So let's say that Ramesh says, nope, you have eight hours, but you don't have 12 hours. Okay, I still want you to have great goals. I want you to understand your derailers and be working on them. I want you to be uh, connecting and networking well in the organization. I want you to be in the biggest, most developmental experiences to grow yourself. Um, I want you to be managing your, your, your sleep so that you're healthy and, and show up as a high. So all the fundamentals still apply. Now, might I not get as much out of you because you're only willing to work eight hours and not 12? Yep, I can't change the math on that. But for the eight hours that you are there, I can get even more from you. So I can get the best eight hours possible. Mark, you have talked about the goal setting uh, out of your eight steps. So goal setting, if I uh, divide these into two uh, goals, one is the business goal, maybe the long-term goal, another maybe the development goal or employee development goal. So how, how uh, the leaders can set the goals, business goals, as well as the development goals, employee development goals? Sure. First, I like separating those two. So and we do a lot of work around goal setting with companies all around the globe. And my advice is always, let's separate those conversations. And I'll come back to development. Let's start, though, with just good old-fashioned performance goals. Most companies, and my clients are all big, fancy, big companies, um, most are not good at goal setting. And the challenge is what they do is they list activities. So if, uh, if you're my boss, Ramesh, I'd come to you, here are the 15 things I'm doing this year, boss. Okay, you're busy. I understand you're busy, but what are you delivering to our organization? And that's the crucial conversation that we have with, with senior leaders around the globe. We know you're busy. You have 100 things to do. But why are you doing these 100 things? What are the few big outputs, the few big deliverables, the few big promises that you're making to our organization about what you're going to deliver? the most powerful thing that I think we do when we advise companies is exactly that. Condense all those activities to three or four goals because none of us has more than three or four truly big, important things to do during the year. Again, we're all very busy, but to what end? So I would start with that. Most companies aren't great at, at goal setting, and yet they spend a ton of time at the end of the year on reviews. And you can't do a darned thing to improve performance at review time. You can only increase performance at goal setting time. So let's do better on performance goals. Let me shift now to development goals. Why do I not like to combine them? Because typically what I find is development goals are not set very well. Um, I find the development planning is the worst process in most organizations. And it's an order of magnitude below the next worst process. Normally, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, and so what I don't want to do is just tag it on to goal setting because you'll probably have a three-minute conversation in that hour meeting uh, about performance and development. So first, I like to have a separate conversation. But here's what I'd like to do um, in relationship for development planning and goal setting. Let's say you're my boss. We talk about my three big goals. What I want to hear from you, and I would advise everyone who's listening to the podcast to think about this question. For the employee that you're speaking with, answer this question in your mind. This person will be an even higher performer this year if they would just do blank. This person would be an even higher performer if they would just do blank. Everyone has an instant answer for every employee. You know exactly what they need to do, more of, less of, differently. 
that should be the primary development goal for this year. So your conversation with me as my manager should be, Mark, we've agreed on these three big challenging goals. It's going to be a stretch to achieve these, but I think you can do it with the right uh, coaching, the right help. But there's one thing that I think that if you do more of will allow you to more successfully achieve these goals. And it is you know, this behavior, take this class, but it's that one secret. If we have that conversation, now development feels a lot more practical because it's very directly related to we need to get these three things done. I'm being, or you're being transparent with me, Mark, um, you need to network better with your peers. You have a lot of people in this company who've done the work that I'm asking you to do. They can help you out. So expand that network. That now feels like a practical development conversation. Um, now, why do I like separating that? Because I, I want to have a... Um, a genuine, complete, meaningful development conversation. I don't want it to be something tagged on to the end of performance where you say, Mark, you should uh, read a book. Read this book. That's your development. Okay, that, that's not going to help anybody. Mm -hmm. um, I want to under – well, I mean, my books help, but nobody else's. Mm -hmm. um, I want to understand what's the experience that you want to put me into. I want thought about that. Mark, we know that people develop most quickly through experiences. I think the best next experience for you to accelerate your development is X. And let's have a meaningful conversation about that. So, again, that's why I think let's focus on performance goals first. Most companies still are not good at that. In that development conversation, let's have it be separate and let's have it be focused on experiences because we know experiences develop people most quickly. So, uh, Mark, uh, uh, many times what happens that uh, employees get uh, stuck in a notion that their manager, uh, leaders, they will drive their career. They will provide them the opportunities. They will develop uh, their performance. But how, how employees as an individual uh, can help themselves and uh, they can improve their uh, performance at the work. Yeah, I would start, I would tell any employee, you own your career. Do not place your success in the hands of someone else. That's just silly. Now, your company might help you. You might love your company. You might love your manager. That's great. But their primary interest is not you. Your primary interest is you. And so what that means is you always need to be thinking about if experiences are the best development tool, what's my next best experience? How am I going to get that next experience? I need to be thinking about, I write about this in chapter four of the book, five of the book, uh, around uh, connecting. Am I building a good network? Because at some point, I'm going to need to rely on other people to help me find that next opportunity. If I just do it in the moment, that's not going to work. Have I built a long-term network of people in my field who I can reach out to and say, I'm, I'm thinking about doing something new. What have you heard about? So you need to be very focused on here is either my ultimate career goal or my next career goal. And what's my personal plan for getting there? I'll give you a personal example. When I was sitting as the talent leader at Avon Products 15 years ago, um, I wrote down very clearly, I want to be a highly successful, highly influential consultant. What do I need to do that? I had three columns. One, I need to establish legitimacy, legitimacy through my ideas. How am I going to do that? Well, that, books are probably a good way to do that. I haven't written any books yet. So one column was write, a, write an initial book to become known, write an, another book to prove that the first book wasn't just a fluke. So it was a kind of a two book strategy. So that was become better known. Um, it was develop trust and networks. So that was, you need to get to know a lot of people. If you only know five people, then no one's going to buy from you. You need to get to know 5,000 or 50,000 people. So there was a column around develop a stronger network. And from that, I created a group in the U.S. called the New Talent Management Network. Uh, and I was very, and still am, very purposeful on LinkedIn uh, about creating a great network. Um, and then it was have your personal, high personal drive around success. So basically, am I committed to making this work? How hard am I going to work to actually make this happen? So I could have gone to my boss at Avon and said, what can you do to help me make this happen? But instead, I said, the only person who truly cares about my success is me. What's my plan to make that happen? So I think we need to take that level of accountability. You might, some of your listeners might be in a company that's very good at, at moving them from fresher to executive, 
and, and cares about them all the way. But as we've seen right now with the tech layoffs, sometimes companies just need to make difficult choices. And do you want to rely on your company that you're never going to be the person who gets caught up in that layoff? So Mark, now I'm coming to the basic question in uh, current uh, context, when we are talking about the quiet quitting, when we are talking about the employees are not engaged. So absolutely, if the employees are not engaged, so definitely that is also going to impact the performance and the productivity uh, of the employees. So in such a uh, uh, scenario, so what should be the right uh, performance management strategy uh, for the HR leaders in this year? Sure. Uh I'll cover some of the same points I did before, maybe a few new ones as well. When we're thinking about performance management, I care about two things. The first is that I'm getting more from you. I'm stretching you. I'm getting more results, whatever that is. Great project management, great software coding, great, great marketing. So I'm setting big, challenging goals that will get more from you. But also, when I set big, challenging goals, ideally, those are also motivational to you. So hopefully, um, if you're my direct report, we're setting goals where you say, yeah, that's a little bit scary, but that sounds kind of fun. Let's let's see if we can make that work. So it's not that these are goals you can do in your sleep. They're still going to take work, but hopefully they're ones that make you feel that you're going to be able to learn. You'll be able to prove yourself, kind of show off a bit. Hey, I'm pretty good at this stuff. Look at my results. So if I'm setting big, challenging goals, um, that should help uh, not only drive performance, but drive engagement, uh, but also reinforce as a, as a manager, I think it's probably time for a, a high level of manager care and, and, and handling in people, reinforce, Ramesh, uh, you're one of my best team members. I really want you to, to be here and be happy. Um, is there anything at work that I can do differently or that we can do differently in this environment to make sure that, that you are here and high performing? So that classic stay interview um, that uh, was written about many years ago, I would want to have that with everybody on my team uh, to understand if there were easily solvable problems that, that hadn't been addressed. That's a great way of just removing barriers that you didn't know existed uh, and elevating engagement. Um, and then uh, I think a lot of it is also just that the fundamentals I talked about before. Do, do people have growth opportunities, a company they can be proud of, enjoyable work environment, et cetera? Mark, what is your upcoming book now? Uh, I'm trying very hard not to write another book. Um, for anyone listening who's written a book, you know it's a gigantic pain in the rear uh, to write a book, and it takes a very I'm long sure. time. Uh, so I am, I do a lot of articles uh, people who follow me know probably at least, you know, hopefully once a month, once every six weeks, I put a new article out because it's a lot easier to capture a thought in 1500 words and then get it out through my network. I have about 50,000 contacts on our mailing list, so I can get my ideas out very quickly in articles. So I'm really focusing there now. I wrote, I wrote the last two books, One Page Talent Management and Eight Steps to High Performance, because I had an idea in my head that I just had to get on paper. I don't have that idea right now. I have a few ideas that are interesting, but they're not compelling. So uh, I'm not saying I'll never write another book. But uh, for right now, uh, there, there's nothing in my head that I absolutely want to spend that time on. Uh, Mark, uh, we tried to cover the talent strategy part and we tried to cover the performance management for the strategy for this. Anything uh, else you would like to share with us you think that is important and we did, we did not discuss here? Uh, I think a few things. One, if you are, if your listeners are in HR, um, I would urge a few things. One is be strategic, meaning have a clear three-year deliverable plan. One of the big missing elements in so many of my clients is their thought about how are we going to manage talent long term? Everyone has their one-year plan. They've had their budget and we'll do these things. But what is your plan to create a compelling work environment? What is your plan to create incredibly high performance? What is your plan to create unbelievably skilled leaders? Those are all things that take more than one year. So think strategically. What's the big deliverable that I want to give to my employer? I want to give you the best general managers in the world. Okay, that sounds like it's going to take five years. What's the plan to make that happen? But also your customers, your internal customers, are going to 
like to hear that from you more than they're going to like to hear, here's my one-year plan. I mean, they're happy with the one-year plan. It's transactional. You're going to hire a thousand people, run the engagement survey. Lovely. But what they really care about is, oh, we're going to have the best general managers in the world. We're going to be incredibly successful if we do that. So that that three-year plan with that big deliverable is going to make your clients far more happy um, than the short plan. And I'd also go to keep improving yourself uh, in our talent management institute that we teach uh, based at the University of North Carolina, but we teach it around the world. We spend a lot of time helping to make HR leaders into great talent builders. And a lot of us in HR were never taught how to do that. And we do our best. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but I would focus, read the article on my website, the four plus two model. We talk about the six factors that differentiate brilliant HR leaders because the more influential we are, the more competent we are, the more fun we can have at work because people are going to want us to do more great stuff for them. So I would say the two big things, be thoughtfully strategic in the long term, but make sure you're improving yourself as an HR leader so that you're seen as an incredibly valuable asset to the business. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining the conversation and sharing your wonderful thoughts. Thank you for inviting